Hi, everyone. I'm Simon Mulcahy, Chief Innovation Officer at Salesforce, and I am incredibly excited to welcome you to this session to discuss the world remade as a result of COVID-19, with a focus on how it's affecting mobility, innovation, consumption, and sustainability. Now, I'm sure all of you know, COVID-19 has greatly impacted all facets of our lives. To help organizations address this pandemic, Deloitte and Salesforce are building on many years of, of collaboration and our shared goal to help organizations around the world prosper and contribute to society. So we came together last spring to utilize scenario thinking, assembling uh, a pretty amazing group of renowned industry leaders to develop a series of possible long-term outcomes for a post-COVID-19 world. And we built these scenarios along two fundamental axes. The first is the severity and duration of the pandemic. Think of like, how long does it take to recover? And then the second axis was the way governments respond to addressing the health and economic effects of the pandemic. How they're coordinated, are they in concert, disparate or, or independent reactions? And today, I'm really excited to be joined by Scott Corwin who's recently been appointed as Deloitte's US leader on sustainability and climate change, and had been leading their global future of mobility practice before that. Scott and I will provide you a brief overview of the scenarios um, and the updates to them, as well as our thinking um, around recent events uh, alongside that. And then we have the real pleasure to be joined by three remarkable leaders who've been shaping innovation in the future of mobility, smart cities and sustainability. So to begin with, let me pass it over to you, Scott, to start perhaps with an overview of the future of mobility. Thanks, Simon, for that very kind uh, and generous introduction. For the past several years, our future of mobility team has been working closely with the private sector, public sector, um, universities, NGOs, labor unions, uh, really around shaping the future of mobility and accelerating realizing the enormous promise it offers. For us, the future of mobility is one where people and goods move with greater precision, safety, and sensitivity to resources, where access to efficient transportation is equitable, where supply matches demand, and where the everyday needs and wishes of citizens are addressed by a broad community of stakeholders working closely together. We've been advancing the idea that ubiquitous access to and intelligent orchestration of multimodal transportation will positively alter urban centers in how we work, how we live, how we progress as a society, and how we address climate change. Prior to the pandemic, we were seeing incredible proliferation, profusion of innovation, um, essentially a multi-dimensional transformation on a global level of a century old system for how people and goods move. The pace of innovation has simply been astounding and we've seen shared models like ride hailing and bike sharing and e-scooters and technological advances in EVs and rapid recharging, uh, autonomous vehicles, unmanned aerial mobility like drones and even Hyperloop. Each has brought forth new business models, challenging legacy systems, principally around private ownership of vehicles. Um, equally so in the delivery of goods with advances in last mile delivery, with small AV vans and mobile lockers and rapid advances, really rapid advances in the last period here around uh, AV long haul trucking and digitization of the entire supply chain um, to give complete visibility and create more flexibility and agility from point of origination to uh, point of delivery. It seemed as though there were almost an exorable sort of force to these trends and that we were moving very quickly. And today what we want to do is really understand the impact that COVID has had on that trajectory. Deloitte and Salesforce developed four scenarios last March to consider how COVID-19 pandemic could accelerate or redirect social, political and business changes over the next three to five years. And today we want to revisit these scenarios and dive deeper into the mobility implications since the onset of the pandemic. 
Now, just a, a brief primer on scenario thinking. Scenario thinking can help us prepare for a future that no one can predict with certainty and really clarify potential implications of our decisions. But scenarios really are stories about what the future may be like. They're not predictions about what will happen. They're, think of them as hypotheses about what could happen, designed really to open our eyes to new opportunities or even hidden risks. So when, when we discuss these scenarios, we really encourage you to, to challenge yourselves to imagine how opportunities you were sure would happen could now actually perhaps be on a different course. Consider these scenarios though as guidelines as really actually different components of each scenario may exist in the future of mobility that actually comes to pass. We're, um, we're already seeing how different countries or regions are impacted by the pandemic, facing varying versions of these scenarios even today. And I'll provide you an overview of the scenarios and then Scott will discuss really the implications of the, um, of the mobility landscape. So with that, let's jump straight into the scenarios. And the first scenario is what we call the passing storm. And this is where the pandemic really shakes society. But after a slow start, it's really met with an increasingly effective health system and an effective government response. And in this scenario, the virus is actually eradicated more rapidly than anticipated due to you know, coordinated measures by global players to spread awareness, sharing of best practices, and really actually similar to what we've seen in countries like Taiwan in New Zealand and in reality. So while trust is renewed in these public institutions, the pandemic still causes long-term economic impacts, especially on small businesses, as well as lower and middle income individuals. And we've seen this today, actually, if you look in the world, the K-shaped economic recovery, where different communities have recovered at different paces, is a good example of this. This has really actually sharpened tensions even between socioeconomic classes. And this in turn shines a light on many different social injustices. Our second scenario we call the good company scenario. And this is really where, where COVID-19 pandemic persists past the initial projections, placing actually a massive burden on governments around the world who are really struggling to handle the crisis on their own. And in this scenario, public-private partnerships really surge as companies step up to be part of a more global solution and really lead the research, development, and deployment of much-needed innovations that really are focused on mitigating the spread of the virus. And of course, we're already actually seeing this uh, happen with new pop-up ecosystems arising as, as companies across industries are partnering really to respond to the critical needs um, that are arising and driving much needed innovation. Social media companies, platform companies, and tech giants have actually proven to gain new prestige and drive growth despite the pandemic. And then companies shift further towards stakeholder capitalism with a more empathetic stance on how you know, business can best serve their customers, shareholders, and employees to rebuild after the crisis. However, that can, can actually come with its own challenges, as we've seen, with an asymmetry between the financial markets and uh, the economy. We've already seen a lot of this taking place, actually, where um, as the legacy transportation and mobility providers have had to kind of focus on their core business, we've seen the technology players step up, for example, around detecting, uh, deploying new technologies for COVID detection, transmission, and tracing, in terms of the advances in e-commerce um, around goods delivery, the rapid progress, which is just unbelievable in terms of what's going on in long haul AV trucking, and the recognition that um, we need to be able to get into uh, challenging, potentially um, uh, vulnerable environments and be able to move more goods um, quickly, and we've seen it actually around the entire supply chain um, now being set up for vaccine distribution. And what's interesting about this is that as the tech players begin to play more of a role, and they're doing it in response to the fact that governments are being pressed to the limits, their, their resources are depleting, they're stepping in to fill a void in the public space that the public sector is just really struggling to, to deliver on. Um, the question will be, 
will we get increasingly more comfortable with sharing data about ourselves and the use of that data um, in this sort of environment? Uh, and we believe that under this scenario, we will. And what that means is that we'll catalyze sort of the digital platforms that undergird of where, where mobility wants to head in terms of mobility as a service or mobility operating systems for cities to re-equilibrate supply and demand and to level load the capacity to meet the needs. So in our third scenario, sunrise in the East, China and, uh, and the other East Asian countries manage the disease much more effectively, while, especially while Western nations struggle. And that has deep and lasting impacts driven actually by slower and inconsistent responses. The global center of power shifts decisively east as China and East Asian nations take the reins as primary powers are on the world stage. And they really lead global coordination of the health system and other multilateral institutions. Now, a version of this has been shown to be true as Asian company countries have actually been able to confront the pandemic much more effectively. Um, mass data collection is commonplace in Asia and has really helped to improve the tracking, reporting and mitigation of potential outbreaks. The, the ability of East Asian nations to contain the outbreak through a strong centralized government response may prove actually to become the gold standard. In what we call lone wolves, governments adopt uh, isolationist policies, forcing supply chains to reestablish themselves much more completely in their home country in the name of uh, local security. The COVID-19 pandemic becomes a prolonged crisis as waves of disease rock the globe for much longer than anyone expected. And due to you know, mounting deaths, social unrest, and economic freefall, the invisible enemy is frankly everywhere. Pa paranoia and isolationism um, grow abound. And nations really put strict controls on foreigners, government surveillance increases as the technology monitors people and, um, and their movements. So in this scenario, you see government playing a much bigger role in terms of the direction of the movement of people and goods and investment. Um, they exert stronger control over capital flows, directing it towards national champions um, with an emphasis on job creation, uh, with growing geopolitical tensions and virus readiness concerns, you could see the military ending up becoming a leading source of investment in mobility and innovation. And while this scenario may be less likely here in the United States as a result of the election and changing administrations, we still may see the use of shared modes decline in favor of privately owned cars. Given the severity of the economic impact we would expect total miles travel to decline. But it is unclear if this ultimately leads to cleaner forms of mobility and very much dependent on the source of domestic energy supplies. And while it's important to keep in mind that we don't think any one of these individual scenarios is, is likely to be the singular path forward, we are finding that there's a huge value for leaders to assess the impacts of kind of differing possibilities on their strategies, service, and even product portfolios, you know, how they will fulfill shifting customer expectations and needs. With these scenarios in mind, I'm really excited to introduce our three panelists. They're all good friends of ours. We've worked with them. We've been actively shaping the ecosystem. We've had incredibly rich and robust dialogues over the last several years about the direction. So joining us today, we have Trina Van Pelt, who's the vice president at Intel Capital. In addition to her work leading Intel Capital, Trina focuses on growth investments and in enterprise software as a service, in intelligent edge, artificial intelligence, and urban mobility. She also chairs Intel's, Intel Capital's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. Secondly, we have Bridget Fawcett, who is the global head of strategy and co-head of sustainability at City and the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on the Future of Financial and Monetary Systems. Bridget is a member of City's Institutional Global Client Committee and is actively engaged in City's gender equity and inclusion initiatives. And last but not least, we have Riley Brennan, who's a founding general partner at Truck 
Talks, a seed stage venture capital fund for entrepreneurs, changing the future of transportation. Riley also authors the weekly Future of Transportation, probably the most influential newsletter in mobility. We all read it. Um, we all get smarter every week from it. So we are delighted to hear from each of you about how the pandemic has significantly altered our way of life and how this is affecting the direction of the future of mobility. Let's kick off with which aspects of these scenarios hold true for you today and why, and maybe we'll just go one by one by one. So Trina, maybe you could share your sort of impressions and reaction of these different scenarios and where we are. Sure, and uh, thank, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I think I, I most ascribe to the passing storm. I just do think it's just a, a fundamental aspect of innovation um, is that we are nimble and adapt and there's, there will continue to be enduring shifts and continued evolution of, of mobility. You know, I do think that there will be enhanced um, you know, health and sa sanitary expectations um, across many things, but I still think fund fundamentally core is probably still going to be just like the safety of you know, autonomous and other vehicles and um, you know, consolidation is going to be natural. That being said, I think there's aspects across the other ones that I think will continue to play out. Um, one, I think private industry is going to continue to grow and be and be a leader versus it being coming from all governments. I don't really see um, a unified global government, you know, standard because we have different cultures, we have different people, different different industries and needs. Um, not one size fits all. Um, so I think that we will continue to see where we can learn from each other with best practices um, as it relates to. Um, mobility, um, but not being able to apply it to all because, you know, our environments are very different. Um, I, you know, secondly, I do think China is going to have, you know, a lead and it, as we're looking at robo taxis and other places, it will, but I do expect that other countries are going to seek to keep pace and continue to um, innovate. Um, and I think just lastly, I think that there will be um, with all the other, you know, pandemic related areas, an increased focus in this like last mile. Um, but, you know, in the end, it really is about finding, you know, and developing scalable and viable businesses where you do have supply and demand matching and, um, and like really providing, you know, value to the ultimate consumer of the services. Trina, thank you very much. Bridget, same question, sort of what are your impressions of these scenarios, uh, which were developed actually back in March and April and where we are today? Yeah, well, uh, firstly, uh, thank you, uh, Scott, and thank you, Simon, and it's uh, nice to be uh, with uh, uh, my fellow panelists uh, today uh, discussing this. Um, I would say that the scenarios are uh, super interesting. They're very ambitious uh, in terms of the, the depth of thinking that you've all applied to these. Um, I, I'd like to, um, you know, coming from uh, a grammar school background, uh, we're, we're more, we tend to think of scenarios as it is. It is it an L-shaped recovery? Is it a K-shaped recovery? Is it a W? Is it somewhere in between? Um, but when you talk about the scenarios that you laid out, I probably would say that uh, a, a passing storm drives drives uh, the good company. And, um, and that's how I'd like to think about kind of the future. Um, and there's no doubt that there will be various um, uh, regional paces uh, of change. Um, and the East will be a significant player, China in particular, uh, as Trina already articulated. But I think Trina really summed it up uh, very well is that, you know, the reality is that the mobility sector is a long-term transformational play. And therefore, um, the um, components of mobility are going to continue uh, to move, maybe accelerated in certain areas, just given what we've seen in the digital agenda. Uh, but I think they're gonna move forward um, uh, with uh, some fits and starts uh, over the next uh, 10 years very uh, solidly. So um, I'm going to pause there because I I'm sure uh, we have more insight uh, coming on. And Riley, your perspective on these scenarios, please. Thanks uh, to my friends at Deloitte and Salesforce for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I would say one of the, um, of the four scenarios, I guess the sunrise in the east is the one that I, um, I probably think is um, the one that we're going to be dealing with. The reason for that is I believe the transit and infrastructure spend is kind of the leading indicator of how you think about integrating all things within um, a city. And so if you spent the most previously to, to put all this money into infrastructure, to transit, 
you have more people relying on that for their actual way of life. In the United States, with the paltry amount we spend on infrastructure and roads and um, public transit, um, it's actually easier for us with private car ownership to put some of these decisions back a little bit, unfortunately. And so I look for leaders in the East who have spent close to eight, nine percent on infrastructure and transit to actually lead because um, I think a lot of the stuff related to privacy that we've been talking about, um, people thought that maybe social networking or photo sharing was kind of the evolution of where privacy was headed and tracking pixels. And I think what's interesting is this pandemic is really about now tracking people and what sort of countries and what cultural values do you have about the good of tracking so that you can cut down on some of these things we're seeing. Um, so I think social networking was this thing that we all talked about as being um, this breaking point for privacy. And I actually think the bigger thing that's going to happen is how we react to pandemics. Um, and I say that plural because I would imagine in the next decade or two, there'll be other situations like this. And so an integrated approach to how to run cities, how to deal with transportation, how to deal with data um, is really the work of the next generation. And unfortunately, because I'm an American, I think that we're not going to see leadership here. We're going to see it from other places first. That's my point of view. COVID-19 has not only created a health crisis, but also profound economic challenges. So for mobility, this has limited funding for R&D, led companies to reprioritize investments and forced organizations to really rethink their business models, and especially around uh, greater resiliency. Many companies may have to choose whether or not to, co to cut costs further, to weather through the pandemic, or, or even double down and invest in the future. And we're certainly no stranger to this at Salesforce. This will have an impact on our real estate strategy, where and how our employees work, as well as you know, even how we engage our customers. Riley, you, you've re sort of emphasized how varying business models have been better at weathering kind of the, the COVID-19 storm. And I'm thinking in particular of companies that have built you know, mobility partnerships to scale rather than trying to kind of own different aspects of the whole ecosystem themselves. How have you seen the um, innovation landscape changing as a result of COVID-19? And then, and then maybe sort of separately, how would you counsel mobility innovators to approach those partnerships differently than they might've done so say a year ago. Sure, thanks Simon. I think obviously one of the big things is delivery and logistics became so much more important this year than um, you know, more people, at least in the investment community were focused on passenger related concepts, passenger AV, robo taxi. And I always looked at trucking and commercial vehicles in AV as kind of, um, the Sancho Panza of the investment landscape. And this year, all of a sudden, it became the really the most important thing. In fact, some of the robotaxi companies tried to pivot into doing more on delivery and, and logistics. So clearly a thing that we're all seeing is that the growth of um, normal everyday life things for delivery um, was necessary. I think the really big question to ask is, have we gone past the point of habit where even people who previously didn't get much delivered at all now have been using these experiences so long that they figure why ever go back? And if you think about other business models, like for example, we have shipped in our house, which is this grocery delivery service, and you have to pay for 12 months to use shipped. So even if the pandemic were to end this morning, um, we still have paid, you know, months in advance. And so I think we're going to see a lot of those things that remain when it comes to business models that can be robust in a city. I've been impressed by some of the shared asset companies that have worked with cities. We saw a lot of interesting behavior in March and April where some of the scooter providers pulled out of cities right away and some didn't. And I think um, they probably don't realize that those city leaders who are are responsible for giving out permits are going to remember those instances. So if you're a big micro mobility provider and you want to go back next summer and ask for 2000 more permits in the city of San Francisco, the question is going to be, you know, what did you do for me during COVID? And that's a really interesting thing to ask. And there were a few companies who did some great things by cities and a few who didn't. Um, so 
I think, you know, this was a kind of a big moment to see a lot of shifts. And I do believe that a lot of the shifts that we've seen this year in e-commerce and in transportation are going to stay well beyond the vaccine. Thank, thanks, Riley. Trina, maybe let's just switch to you. You've built a really robust portfolio of leading mobility innovators at Intel Capital. So maybe just a couple of questions and starting with, with the first one. How how's the, the pandemic affected your assessment of market opportunities? Perhaps some more attractive going forward and some less attractive than, say, you might have thought a year ago? Sure. So <clears throat> as you're looking at various opportunities, I mean, at, at like the highest level, it's very much focused on, you know, one, the market opportunity, <clears throat> two, like what is something that's very unique and differentiated about what this company is doing? And third, the overall, the team and their ability to execute. You know, on the market, you know, I do think that sure, there are some things that slow down, but as was said before, this is a long-term play. Um, you know, it wasn't expected that we were going to have robo taxis on the road um, in 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 2020, um, and and so I think that we're going to continue to see. You know, um, and I think what's important is that as companies are getting started and how, as as entrepreneurs are thinking about <clears throat> what makes sense, it is going to be like having this crisp and clarity of vision of what you're looking to accomplish, and really thinking through a very efficient capital allocation and growth. Um, so, you, so you can grow capital efficiently because in the end, you have to be a viable business that, that can survive. Um, I think also, you know, the, the teams who can really demonstrate that they, that they can truly execute. But, but, I, but it, and also like this is, it's a long-term vision, but I think what we've seen has also been really successful is you're not just leaping to like the massive end-to-end. -end. You're doing some various different steps along the way to continue to prove out the technology and innovation experiment and kind of get the feedback from from consumers you know whether that's you know enterprise consumers or or um, individuals of kind of like what works and what doesn't to continue to adapt um, I will say I think also um, what's very interesting there's been an incredible capital flow um, but as I think like the life cycle of companies I can see where there could be some different impacts um, you know first like on the seed and early stage you know those are not expected to have you know um, deep penetration into customer markets for a handful of years. So they have a lot of kind of room for kind of building out that vision. You know, then on the other extreme, you know, with, with SPACs, you know, we're seeing so many other companies, you know, in and around is some, some of the you know, technology providers being able to access more capital that way. And I think what can get really tricky is kind of in between where there could almost be a little bit more of a kind of a crunch of some of those companies that have proven, but um, they, they have products, but are, is the market really there for them to develop and have, do they have the adequate cash reserves to kind of weather, weather that storm? Uh, but I think so much of that can still be very, very well managed by um, if you truly, if, if you truly are developing something um, and technology that does really solve and improve co um, consumers' lives, you know, there will be a path forward. Brilliant. So that would be your advice then to the kind of mobility innovators, focus on on you know on on the actual need of the of the end customer. Yeah, and fo and focus on use cases that are relevant today. You will learn. Mm -hmm. Like you know, again, there's this jump to you know jumping to passenger vehicles. You know, and as Riley said, how people are paying so much more attention to goods. You can learn an incredible amount now with goods. And ironically, with like less congestion on the roads, what a great um, you know test field that you have for more more trucking where you can you can test some things with that less congestion to help actually extend it. Um, and I think I just encourage people to be really creative and nimble of thinking about how do you like take advantage of the current environment of some things that were maybe limitations to you before that enable you to go to, um, to, to move forward. Brilliant. Some really great insights here. Here's a question uh, to you again, Trina, but also Riley, I'm going to come back to you on this question as well. What, technologies and services are likely to see more accelerated growth and increased investment then? Let me start with you, Trina. You know, I, I think continuing, you know, as, um, as we kind of look at what is needed for autonomous, right, you need to have redundancy, you know, scalability, 
um, you need regulation, regulatory support, um, as well as like having in the end, like a viable business that, that can be profitable. So I think continuing to drive for those um, technologies that enable that redundancy and capabilities of kind of um, scalability. I do think we're going to see more specifically in this last mile delivery and focus on goods, you know, companies repositioning their assets to go do that until you get enough um, adequate um, consumer passengers. But, you know, I know even like through you through Mobileye um, that, you know, looking to have robo taxis, you know, a, a, a hundred um, car fleet, you know, in Tel Aviv in 2022. Um, mm-hmm. But that's because there's regulatory approval to go do that. And I think as we continue to see that in various other jurisdictions, you know, we may be able to test a little bit more. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Riley, same question to you. Yeah, I'm excited about the interface between technology and cities, um, particularly ways that cities can make more money or make more use out of the assets they have. So, uh, for example, if you look at the average, you know, land use of a lot of these parking spots in cities, you know, many cities didn't see the revenue that they previously saw month over month um, because people weren't driving downtown to park. And obviously in many cities, I think Seattle was probably the first city to do this where they did dynamic smart zones for restaurant pickup. And so I'm interested in the ways that cities can use their assets dynamically um, because one, there's probably going to be a greater look at how we're using this public space, whether it's for uh, pickup for livery, whether it's for bike lanes, whether it's for traditional parking. Um, But historically cities have had a hard time doing that because they had to paint the road and they had to put a sign up. And there's a lot of technologies now in terms of software that allow for dynamic um, loading zones. So, you know, for example, we have a company called Cord out of New York City that does that on behalf of a few cities. And I think that's a really interesting space to watch because it allows for greater flexibility. On the AV side, I would agree with Trina. I think um, AVs have kind of gone through this public, you know, sign curve where in the beginning of this year, I think a lot of people had said, I remember somebody said to me, oh, autonomous vehicles, like those are over. And I think to myself, well, who, who arrived here today in an autonomous vehicle? They can't be over before they started. Um, and so it surprised a lot of people, I think, the announcements recently, obviously from the big, you know, uh, Cruise and, and Waymo and others who have made these big announcements and shown some interesting work they've been doing. So I think that... Uh, on the high end of AV robotaxi, we're going to actually see real deployments, geospecific in cities earlier than people thought. And then in the meantime, in the next sort of five to 10 years for passenger vehicles, a greater emphasis on ADAS or advanced driver assistance systems, um, which really now are trickling down to even the most inexpensive new cars. And so um, that is going to pre- present some really great challenges and opportunities for startups. Um, it's going to change the risk landscape and a lot of other things. So um, there's always a lot of stuff in transportation, Simon, because transportation touches all parts of life. And this is, by the way, why I think it's such a great area to focus your investment efforts on um, and why I like what I do. But it touches all these aspects of life, almost like health does or food. Um, and so it's really exciting. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, with that, I think it'd be great now to transition over to sustainability. And, and I have to take this moment to to congratulate you, Scott, on your uh, new and very exciting role at Deloitte leading sustainability for, for North America. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Um, in many respects, I would argue that um, the focus and emphasis on sustainability has always been there as it relates to mobility innovation, we just probably haven't made it as central and emphasized it as much. And with what I think is really interesting as a result of the uh, pandemic is that uh, we've seen things like telemedicine and distance learning and work from home accelerate at a pace that no one ever imagined. And we've been talking about these things for decades. This is not as if these were new concepts but the urgency and the hard reality of the pandemic sort of accelerated them. And when we come out of it, we probably won't return to the way things were before. But there've been some real unanticipated benefits that have come from that at a, at a great cost. Don't misunderstand me. But for example, we've seen clean air return to cities 
that had been smog filled and hadn't actually seen clean air. I heard LA, um, a very senior official there told us a few weeks later that, you know, 10 miles from the beach, you could actually see all the way from a high enough level uh, because of smog. We've seen congestion decline. We've seen the sort of repurposing of the city street landscape, the way that Riley was talking about, and a recognition of the value of that built environment. So, Bridget, I'd like to talk to you about this because you too, by the way, have taken on a parallel role. We've spent a lot of time talking about that. And City has made some really profound announcements around what it is aiming to do in sustainability and climate change um, and social justice and many other things. So let's start with if you could maybe share an overview of City's approach to this and sort of the direction that city globally is trying to take? Sure, sure. Um, I'd be happy to do that. I, I think maybe before I do that, and I guess, you know, coming from city and having been here for a while, we, we've been on a journey of sustainability for a very long time, uh, you know, for over 20 years. Um, of course, it's now uh, uh, in vogue uh, for lots of good reasons that you uh, articulated, and, and we can talk about Therefore, what does that mean in terms of what we're focused on and how we even accelerated uh, the areas of focus? But I just want to go back a little bit to the transformation conversation we were having earlier and tie it into the sustainability piece. Because you know, I think at the end of the day, what COVID has exposed that we all know is that we need to have uh, resilient uh, business models, right, to be able to drive uh, long-term uh, sustainable growth. And so while, um, and what's uh, critical in that is that you know, at the end of the day, we're addressing and what COVID has exposed is some of these systemic risks that we may not have been uh, so focused on. And I think that there has been a slow uh, march uh, from uh, 2015 uh, with uh, the Paris Agreement and the, the development of the, or rather the SDG, UN development of the SDGs, and then the ensuing Paris Agreement, um, uh, a march around uh, the um, notion of uh, stakeholder capitalism, really moving from just uh, shareholder to broader stakeholder uh, needs. And so that 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 journey was underway for many uh, businesses, governments, um, uh, private sector, public sector. And I think COVID has just uh, really exposed the systemic risks and has further accelerated that need to have these resilient models. And when we go back to the, the mobility implications, part of what we've seen uh, COVID do is really um, force uh, actors in the mobility space to pick their core expertise because of capital needs. And I think in some ways, by, by doing that and doubling down, and we're seeing this with the OEMs, we're seeing this uh, on the technology side, as Trina described, um, and as Riley uh, described, uh, you know, where businesses are focusing on their area of expertise in the over, over the longer run, what that might do is actually even further accelerate uh, mobility. Uh, because rather than having OEMs dabbling in a lot of different elements of autonomous or shared services uh, or the, the focus on electrification, uh, they're now picking spots uh, within that continuum because of uh, being having to allocate their capital accordingly. And it might, in, in some ways over the long term, help uh, the, the holistic transformation of mobility uh, accelerate. That's probably another conversation we can have uh, at a different time. But it did strike me that in some ways this um, move to specialization, if you will, that some folk, uh, actors are having to, to make over the long term may accelerate uh, what we're actually trying to achieve. Um, Back to the sustainability play, though, um, the, the, the critical, it, it is critical when we think about the broad um, risks that, you know, we're facing as a society, um, you know, whether it be a climate change, whether it be just uh, the social inequities that COVID has exposed, uh, whether it be digital disruption and hopefully the opportunities, but also the challenges around workforce displacement potentially around that. Uh, we do have to act in a more collaborative way because not there's no single government or a single uh, company that's gonna be able to scale solutions. Um, and so City has been very focused on that. Um, and we've uh, focused historically, um, certainly around the environment and climate. Uh, we've had very um, 
a specific goals as it relates to that. Uh, but most recently, what you're reference is, referencing is our, our rollout of our 2025 uh, sustainable progress strategy, where we've actually identified and earmarked uh, $250 billion uh, to focus and support on uh, the uh, low carbon uh, transition that's uh, so uh, desperately uh, needed. Um, and so we are um, certainly in the market uh, with that. The good news is that what we're finding is that banks overall are also driving uh, to towards low carbon uh, 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 transitions and really um, being much more intentional around their commitments in this space. So we're seeing really banks step up in a very different way to help support this transition of the economy. Uh, that is also uh, in some ways a growth agenda uh, uh, for uh, businesses as we think about the, the new uh, emerging um, green economy uh, uh, businesses that are going to uh, evolve as a, as a result of this. Um, we're also very focused on climate risk as part of that. Um, and you you'll, may have seen the announcement that we actually appointed a new ch uh, chief climate risk officer. Uh, and we're going to, uh, we're seeing that uh, with some of our peers as well. Uh, but the really the need and the ask by our consumers, by our shareholders, by regulators to be more transparent around understanding what are the physical and transition risks associated with climate. Um, and so we're really being much more um, uh, uh, careful around how we think about uh, our portfolios, what the carbon intensity is, and, and really what are the transition plans for, for our uh, borrowers, our clients, and how can we support them in that way. And then of course, for, for a long time, we've been very focused on sustainable operations uh, and really reducing the environmental uh, footprint uh, of our uh, overall businesses uh, globally. Um, so, that, so there is a whole sustainable progress strategy as it relates to what I would say environmental matters. But for a long time, we've also been very focused on um, really the systemic inequities in society. We've been very focused in, in forward on gender and gender diversity and the pay gaps that we see around gender, not only just within city, which we've been disclosed what the median pay gaps are and how do we address that, uh, but also um, how we support our, uh, our clients uh, and governments around helping to drive to more to more equitable uh, society. And we, of course, uh, racial justice is one of the priorities there. We just announced a, a very fulsome uh, racial justice uh, program to help to support um, uh, minority owned, black owned uh, businesses, um, really thinking about our supply chains uh, differently, uh, thinking about our mentorship programs, et cetera. So the whole host of efforts. And frankly, we're seeing our clients do all of those things as well on the sustainability front. So thank you. I actually wanna pull two different strands of things you said and help me see how they connect. Okay. The first one was you sort of made the point about the efficiency of the capital markets in allocating capital and um, this sort of increased specialization or narrowing of focus that maybe some of the frothiness of the mobility marketplace and valuations, you know, the pandemic has maybe forced a, a new reality to that. But then secondly, and it ties a little bit to what Riley and Trina have also referenced as well, to create a um, more uh, fit for purpose, sustainable, inclusive, equitable mobility system requires these different players to cooperate and collaborate in very non-traditional and profoundly different ways. Absolutely. So, so, you know, so how do you bring all of these large players together? Who is the convener or orchestrator of that ecosystem? Yeah. And what's missing in this equation that, that um, for, because the promise is so incredible. So the question is, how do we make that promise a reality? Uh, also with a sustainability lens, because I do think that, that there is a, a real sense of urgency in terms of we don't have much time. Right. And, yeah. We have to move on that. Yeah, and I think you know you mentioned earlier that the um, you know the, the mobility um, ecosystem in some ways is the most beautiful sustainability play in its perfection, right? Um, really addressing um, the environment, addressing uh, inequities, uh, really uh, addressing um, you know 
the population challenges and growth of cities. Uh, so in some ways, it is the perfect uh, case study of uh, a sustainable, future sustainable society. Um, I think the challenge has been, you know, in some ways that the focus around innovation, whether it's connected cars, whether it's shared uh, mobility, whether it's, you know, autonomous driving or electrification hasn't, hasn't been so clear, right? You know, think about some of the big OEMs, they're trying to, as they think about long-term relevancy, trying to figure out where do they play in that transformation. Right. That's historically then COVID hits and all of a sudden you, you uh, have to deal with a short term reality of your short term earnings uh, as any uh, public company uh, has to do. But you also have to maintain your long term relevance. And so you have to pick spots when you have uh, you know, a short shortage of capital or you don't have, uh, you know, um, uh, you have to d determine where you're going to deploy your capital that you do have. And so this is back to the, you know, the core expertise. And I think what we've seen with the OEMs is really kind of a, a fundamental shift into the electrification uh, model. And so while they've all been dabbling in that over the years, and some have been more than dabbling, uh, there really has been, I think, a very concerted effort uh, by uh, uh, large OEMs to, to recognize that this is where they have to align uh, in the near term. And we're seeing, you know, huge amounts of uh, capital needs in that space. It's not just uh, the U.S. OEMs or the European OEMs. We're seeing Chinese OEM uh, needs uh, significant as well. So I, I do think that what that will do is it's going to create an alignment uh, in some ways globally around this pursuit of electrification that will then allow in some ways the autonomous and connected and shared uh, components of mobility to, to accelerate uh, 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 faster. You know, your question around how do you, how do you get folks uh, to move and scale uh, differently than they have before? Well, there's nothing like a big societal problem uh, to be able to bring uh, folks together. And we've certainly seen that with the vaccine and the acceleration of the vaccine. Um, and that's really required governments and the private sector to work together in new ways to create that acceleration. And I think it really just takes leadership. It's about one or two or three CEOs and governments saying, you know what, we need to solve this and this we're going to get together and this is how we're going to do it. And we are seeing that play out in various consortiums uh, around the world focused on different areas. Uh, and the shipping industry is a great, a great example uh, with the Poseidon principles around uh, leaders in the private and public sector stepping up to say, you know what, we need to solve the carbon challenge that shipping is responsible for over the long term. And we're going to create this forum to, to, to do just that. Um, and, th and we're seeing that replicated across um, different sectors. And of course, with mobility, what's amazing is that it's it's in the heart of the energy transition, both from a supply side and a demand side. Um, and so we will start to see more uh, movement uh, around consortium building to, to solve problems uh, so that there is a, an alignment. Bridget, thank you very much. I know we can and we have and we will like really um, continue this very robust and and um, incredibly intricate. It's very uh, intricate, yeah. right? Really intricate dialogue, mm -hmm. and and hopefully um, this conversation today uh, spawns many others to engage in this dialogue because that is what it's going to take. With that, we're going to move to um, the third part of this, which is the world we made, and I'm going to hand it back to Simon. Thanks, Scott. Well, the world will be a different place after COVID-19, uh, hopefully a much, much nicer and better place. However, the mindset after the pandemic may be temporary, taking us back to you know, pre-pandemic habits or even more permanent shifting mobility behaviors. We've, we've discussed environmental impacts and the shifting business models, and we'll certainly be curious to see where organizations go from here. Definitely at Salesforce, we've started to reshape our strategy already. We recently announced our acquisition of Slack, which will help us uh, create the operating system for the new digital first work from anywhere world. And we're pretty sure that this will uniquely enable companies to grow and actually succeed in any uh, you know, world of which is going to be more digital for sure. Similar strategy development and M&A is happening across the whole world of mobility. So with that as the point, Riley, can you paint for us an overview of which types of business models or services or technologies in mobility will be the most um, successful in the next three to five years? I have no idea. 
to be candid with you. Um, but I will say that the more interesting trends that I think we can all agree on are um, vehicles are getting reshaped. They're both getting bigger and getting simpler. So most companies now, at least in North America, are moving out of small and medium-sized cars, basically realizing that they need to make money in trucks and utilities and commercial vehicles and premium. And the vehicles themselves are going to have a much different architecture. And so that might enable things like full over-the-air updating and some other things that we've dreamed about um, on the vehicle side. On the, um, the things you can do after you've made those difficult hardware decisions, um, we'll see a, a blooming of business models and concepts related to software in the vehicle. I would say today, to be honest, software has not been a great area of development within vehicles. Most of the things that make driving better from a software perspective live on your phone, and they really don't have much to do with a car. So that's an interesting transition we will see after a bunch of hardware changes. Um, in parallel to that, I do think there are going to be some really interesting brands built um, with a focus on small vehicles. So I'm not certain that an auto company is also going to have a great lightweight electric vehicle brand. It could be that we see an upstart um, that effectively has a, a Tesla on two wheels, whether that starts in the United States or tar starts in a two wheeled um, country like India. I'm not sure. But I do think that over the next 10 years, we're going to see a company that we think about like Tesla um, that comes from a small, maybe two, three wheeler perspective and has a premium high quality customer experience um, that makes people want to buy those vehicles. Cause you have to remember with electric vehicles, there were many electric vehicles for decades before Tesla came along, except they weren't very high in desirability. And so Tesla changed that part of the landscape and changed how other people think about EVs. And I think small vehicles are going to go the same direction once we have a breakthrough and some innovation and some um, some creativity there. So that's how I think about it. So, so how, thanks for having then, me today, by the way. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. How then do do companies determine where to you know what the most important areas to fund are? Mm -hmm. Well, I, for from our perspective, you know, there's so many problems in transportation. Um, you know, if you look at the vehicle itself, I think that the inter interaction between humans and machines is going to be the work of our lives. So, you know, how do humans really get along with the vehicle? How does the vehicle know what the human is doing? Um, whether you're looking at driver monitoring systems or risk systems, things like that, whether it's for passenger cars or trucking, that's such an important piece, largely unsolved. You can see it when people have accidents in a Tesla autopilot that they thought was autonomous and it's not. And so I'm really interested in the interplay between humans and their vehicles, whether they're large or small, and also the interface between uh, vehicles and cities and how we kind of understand how to make the best use of those um, short dwell times, how to get your Amazon packages to you safely, all those kind of things. And so on a, at a macro level, Simon, I can give you some good ideas. I can't give you the specifics for those ideas because um, unfortunately, when what I do is fund early stage ideas. Many of those ideas will, you know, will have a short lifespan and a few of them will change the world. Fantastic. Well, when you, when you find those, let you have to let me know before you tell anybody else. Um, Trina, moving to you, you lead Intel's Intel Capital's diversity, equality, uh, equity and inclusion initiative that you launched in 2015. Based on the disproportional impact of COVID-19 to both the startup community and to women and underrepresented minorities, has your investment focus shifted? And if so, how? Thanks. So overall, um, you know, DE&I has been core to Intel, Intel and Intel Capital's values and is just how we work. And we have a strong history of it where we began this initiative, you know, in 2015, um, which began with a commitment to invest 125 million over five years, specifically in um, d diverse management teams um, and founders. And, uh, we, we met that in two and a half years and now five years in, we're well over 400 million. So, we've, but we've done it in a way of kind of, we stay, we, we stay very true to who we are. Um, so, you know, 
Intel Capital is a thesis-driven um, investment organization. We invest in domains that are strategically relevant um, to, to Intel. And so that part hasn't shifted. And yet, it, you know, in and of that, it, where there's like, I think there's like, you know, stereotypes or views of like, where can you find diverse founders? We've been able to meet that. So, you know, it's, it's where it hasn't shifted um, from, that, from that focus where it comes into is, is how we work, you know, really encouraging our inv investors, you know, we're in a partnership model to seek to expand their networks and go, you know, find and source deals um, uh, in, in places they may not have looked before. Some of that is geographic areas, but it's also like really kind of building those overall networks because um, we've kind of self-imposed um, this, this, um, this kind of reporting on ourselves. And so that part hasn't shifted. And we stay very true to, you know, what is a deal that we will invest in, both kind of where we see we can add value as an investor and where we see it's financially, you know, viable um, as an opportunity. And, you know, I think that's what's really important too, is making it really clear that there's no different bar. Um, it's really been about pushing and encouraging because we do have a strong belief that when you invest in founders and teams that have diverse backgrounds and perspectives and experiences, you get to you know better technology innovation, business growth, and decision making. Um, and so we've been continuing to kind of see that and track that. Um, that being said, you know over the summer we did also kind of re up and amplify what we want to specifically do um, with investing um, with with black founders. You know like of for example like thirty percent of our four hundred million is specifically in black and Latinx um, founders and management teams, um, which which you know is great. But we want to do more um, and and continue to you know specifically um, drive that um, opportunity. We we've made a, a huge um, uh, expansion in investing um, in women and women leaders um, who have been doing fantastic. Uh, but it's something that, again, I think, and th th this is where I think is really important is you as investors and companies, you have to stay true to like to your clarity of purpose of what you're looking to accomplish and then make D, E, and I a way that is just like fundamentally like the way you operate and, and do business. Brilliant. Thank you, Trina. Um, Bridget, turning to you, you, you talked a little bit about um, City's strong focus on diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, including the, the impact fund that, that you launched in February. Can you just maybe expand a little bit on City's DEI approach? Yeah, I think it's it's absolutely it's really an internal and an external approach. I mean, we're super focused on um, ensuring um equity and inclusion and diversity uh, internally with all of our um, uh, different uh, populations. I think we're very proud that we are women-led business uh, with Jane uh, Frazier as a uh, CEO in transition uh, officially starting at the end of February. So um, we also have a board of directors that's 50% women. Uh, so these are some fundamental principles that we believe very strongly in. Uh, we're very committed to, like uh, many uh, of our uh, clients, committed to driving uh, leadership uh, of Black, Latino, um, LGBTQ, uh, uh, women at the uh, more senior levels and ensuring that that is of parity uh, from a representation uh, perspective. So there's a lot of uh, really good work that we're doing internally, uh, both uh, you know across uh, uh, our employee base, um, but really uh, driving uh, towards uh, towards uh, an equitable um, a firm that's really represent representative of the clients and the communities that we serve. Thank you so much. It's been incredibly insight, insightful to hear your perspectives. And maybe I'll pass it back to Scott for you to bring us home. Yeah. So I too want to thank all three of you. Very quickly, I want to do a little lightning round. Your outlook for 2021, 2022, um, in terms of where we're at and where we're headed as it relates to mobility and sustainability. Let's start with you, Trina, please. Well, I'll just say two words, um, impatient and resilient. Good. Um, Riley. Lots of walking and lots of wearing masks um, and hopefully lots of sanitation and a return to public transportation. And Bridget. Uh, I, I would say uh, transformative, uh, transformative growth uh, on the way to a transformative decade. So 
I would just add to that that I feel like the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland, that we're running out of time, we're running out of time, we're running out of time. That's the sustainability hat. And the question is, can we affect um, all of the promise that we're seeing in so many different areas as quickly as possible and not um, sort of go sideways? And I do think that that's a big challenge. I, on behalf of um, Simon and ourselves, um, you're all such good friends of both of our firms. We are really delighted for this um, incredibly rich conversation. I wish we had more time. Um, there's so much more we could have gone into, but undoubtedly we will reconvene and continue this discussion. So thank you very much. <laughs>